It's my privilege now to invite Alan Seed. You have a floor, sir. Thank you. We've been sitting for a long time. So if you'd like to, let's take a moment to, you can stand and stretch and not mandatory, but okay time to do so. Loosen up the body. As Dr. Andrew Weil said, mind and body are only separate in language. Wiggle your toes. Can you feel that? Your mind is down there. The brain is a physical organ, but our, our mind goes way, way beyond. So raise your hand if you cannot hear me clearly. There's a few people. Do we have volume on this? There we go. All right. So in 1987, at the age of 16, I became aware that we're in the largest extinction period since the dinosaurs, driven by human activity. This was a big uh, freak out moment for me. I knew that I could continue to live unconsciously or semi-unconsciously and be part of the problem, or I could consciously, intentionally choose to be part of the solution. But I didn't know what that looked like. I did know that it wasn't enough to preach and sermonize. I needed to walk the talk somehow. I needed to change my own life, but I didn't know what that looked like. And so I made it my goal to find, research, learn the best tools, processes, methodologies, modalities for how to live in harmony within ourselves, with each other, and with the planet. As poet Gary Snyder said, the, the change needs to happen on all levels simultaneously. So we know legisl legislation is not enough. It's important but not sufficient. There's so much more that needs to happen. And here on, the, on, on, on this planet, and I think everybody here is part of these two revolutions that are happening worldwide. And I think of them as revolutions, and I think of them as unstoppable. And one of them is the consciousness revolution. I think emotional intelligence is part of the consciousness revolution, which is how do we deepen our interiors? How do we rise up to the occasion of the needs of the world and show up with love, show up with integrity, show up with care? And there, there are three questions that I think that uh, we, need to, we need to answer. So the first revolution is the consciousness revolution. The second is the ecological sustainability revolution. These, these do have an overlap, but they're, they're distinct. In order to really turn the situation around, there are three questions I think are important for us to ask. The first question is, who are we? Not just consumers, right? Not just people who... Uh, as uh, forgetting the name of the comedian who said, our, our society encourages us to spend money we don't even have, to buy things we don't even need, in order to impress people we don't even like. <laughs> so we need to, we need to re redefine who are we. And we need to redefine what is the good life. What is the good life? And the third question is, what is our shared destiny on this planet. There is no planet B. We're looking, but one light year is hard for me to wrap my mind around, let alone more than that. So this search that started in 1987 for tools, processes, methodologies brought me in kind of a roundabout way to a workshop with Dr. Marshall Rosenberg on nonviolent communication. Before this, I had designed my own major in whole system sustainability. I had studied with a school for field studies, studying sustainable development in Costa Rica. I, had, uh, I was working with high school students, and some of them had some conflicts. I took a conflict resolution training, and I met someone there who invited me to this workshop with Dr. Marshall Rosenberg. So just following the path, I found myself there. And I think it was my second workshop with him where something clicked. If we are going to turn around 
global scale issues like climate change, like species extinction, and many others, we need to excel at cooperation and collaboration skills. Humanity needs to develop these skills. We individually need to develop these skills. And we need, we need to spread the skillfulness in cooperation and collaboration. And emotional intelligence is a huge underpinning of this. It's hard to cooperate and collaborate with others if I don't even know what's going on inside me. So let's start a little bit with, uh, this is a little bit how it works. NVC is short for nonviolent communication. You can see that life alienated communication down here, where we, we connect on images and thoughts, but not much happening at the level of the heart. So the way nonviolent communication works is we're, we're integrating. We're getting brain and heart to work together. But I'd like to start with a name, nonviolent communication, because it's kind of a marketing non-starter. And it doesn't tell people what it is. It tells people what it's not. And what Dr. Rosenberg was attempting to do when calling his process nonviolent communication is he, he was attempting to align himself with Gandhi's m social movement of nonviolence. However, in India, as many people in this room are probably well aware, in India they were using certain words in Hindi that had no direct translation into English. So in Gandhi's time, they used the words ahimsa and the word satyagraha. And ahimsa is, again, no direct translation, but roughly, I am not your enemy, or harmlessness toward all beings. It's a little bit akin to the Buddhist concept of loving kindness, ahimsa. The other word, satyagraha, again, no direct translation into English, has a little bit of a sense of soul force or soul truth or the power of the truth. So we took these two concepts of loving kindness and the power of the truth, and they got turned into nonviolence. Again, uh, it doesn't tell us exactly what it is. It tells us what it's not. And unfortunately, people are losing a historical connection with Gandhi's movement. When I, when I teach, at, for example, a high school, I'll ask if anybody doesn't, has never heard of Gandhi or doesn't know what he did, and a few courageous students who are willing to be honest in front of other people will raise their hands. So this process has other names. Compassionate communication. Empathic communication, because empathy is such a big part of it. Empowered communication, because it's not about being nice. It's about being real and about being connected with your own power. And it has some other names. I've heard uh, in some places they teach it as conscious communication. So it goes by a lot of different names, but this starts to give you a little bit of a flavor of, of where it comes from and what it is. Now, Dr. Rosenberg was a student of a famous psychologist named Carl Rogers. And Carl Rogers at the time was very interested in how is it that authentic human connection can be so healing. And he noticed that sometimes the roles we play get in the way of authentic human connection. The role boss-employee, the role parent-child, the role teacher and the role student, therapist and patient. Sometimes these labels or roles get in the way of seeing each other human to human. So Dr. Rosenberg set out to distill the essential elements in language that contribute to a high quality of connection. So I want to clarify what the purpose of nonviolent communication is. The purpose is to create a high quality of connection out of which people spontaneously enjoy contributing to one another's well-being. When the quality of connection is high, we naturally want to make life more wonderful for each other. It just happens spontaneously. When I met Dr. Rosenberg, and I started studying with him in 1995, when I met him, he had been traveling the world for about 35 or 40 years, mediating conflicts and training people, and he said in every culture, people are playing one of two games. One of those games is called Who's right and who's wrong? The other game is called, how can I make life more wonderful? When there's a high quality of connection, we naturally want to play this game 
making life more wonderful. I want to give you uh, an example that might be something you've experienced in your life. Raise your hand if you've had the following experience. You, perhaps you cooked dinner for someone, you had dinner, dinner guests, and they really enjoyed what you made. Raise your hand if you've had this experience. And just shout out a few people, how did that feel to you? Yeah, it's so fulfilling. Now imagine your dinner guest threatens you to feed them. What happens to that natural joy of giving? It dies. Or let's say your dinner guest tries to guilt trip you into feeding them. Same thing. So this game, Making Life More Wonderful, it turns out human beings love it. We love contributing to one another's well-being, but it only works if we have choice. As soon as I feel pressured, coerced, forced, manipulated in any way, forget it. I don't want to do it. It's no longer fun. So that's the main purpose of nonviolent communication, how to create a high quality of connection out of which spontaneously, naturally, people want to play this game, how can I make life more wonderful? I want to break that purpose down a little bit more because any communication process has both a speaking side and a listening side. So from the speaking side, how do I share my perspective? How do I speak my truth? in a way that's most likely to elicit a compassionate response from the other person. That's most likely to lead to understanding rather than conflict. And how do I speak my truth in a way that's most likely to result in my own needs being met in a way that's in harmony with other people's needs? From the listening side, how can I be present to, how can I be in the face of what might come across as blame, judgment, criticism, a verbal attack, and instead of hearing those things, I'm able to put my attention to what is important to this other person, their values or their needs. Therefore, I'm getting less defensive, I'm able to stand in a more compassionate place, and I'm much more likely to be able to defuse a potential conflict. I've, I've transformed every significant relationship in my life using these tools, and now I'm preventing misunderstandings and conflicts before they happen. Um, one example is uh, I want to write a book with my ex called How We Got Divorced and Kept Our Family Together. <laughs> because no matter what great communication skills you have or how much care there is, if you want different things in life, that's okay. And changing the roles, husband and wife, doesn't have to turn into a war. And with us, we're still friends, and we greet each other with a hug. And we're not husband and wife anymore. We are friends and co-parents. And my children are benefiting from that immensely. In fact, we live next door to each other, so the kids just, they want to walk up to dad's house, they do, or they're sick of dad, they walk down to mom's house. So let me keep going through these slides a little bit. I call this the most overlooked insight to preventing and resolving conflicts, part one, what not to do. Usually what happens is if there's a disconnection, we jump to a solution. We jump to fix it. I see this in families. Oh, don't worry, honey. Daddy will buy you a new one. I see this at work. Okay, fine. I will take on that extra project. I love the story about the boring holes for the wells. Right? There wasn't enough communication. That was one of the things that was illustrated in that story. So we tend to jump to a solution, and those solutions are less durable. And we don't know if they're satisfying the needs of the people involved because we don't even know what those needs are. We have not taken the time to discover them. Now, when I say needs and nonviolent communication, we define that in a very particular way. We're talking about universal human needs. Of course, we have the survival needs, air, food, water, clothing, shelter. But beyond survival, the thrival needs. What are the conditions necessary for any human being to thrive on the planet? Things like love, trust, connection, autonomy, meaning I get to choose my goals and the path for how to get to them. So there's any number of universal human needs. But the word need is tricky because it connotes a sense of lack. 
or I'm missing something. So it's a tricky word. You can think of them as values, but really they are core human uh, motivators. They impel us to act. So universal human needs are an energy that wants to flow, not a hole to be filled. Now, in, within the framework of nonviolent communication, our emotions arise because our needs are fulfilled or not fulfilled. If my need for friendship isn't met, I have certain feelings. If my need for friendship is met, I have other feelings. That's a little bit of the framework of it. So what, what, what I would suggest we practice more is go slow to go fast. Slow it down and connection before solution. So when I slow it down and we get on the same page, my wonderful magical partner Tess is here, and we do this. We'll slow down and get clear what are your needs, what are my needs, before we go to create a solution. Once we're clear what's important to her, what's important to me, now we can, now the, the problem solving becomes collaborative. The solutions are going to be more durable because we know that they're addressing everybody's needs. This happens in groups too, by the way. I was invited to mediate a conflict in a nonprofit. There were about 10 people in the room. Somebody was crying. They started speaking. They shared very clearly what had happened, how they felt about it, and what were their needs or values that were in the way. And then they got into the next thing that had happened, and now they were really sobbing. And before they were done, somebody in the room jumped in and said, oh my goodness, what can we do to make things better for you? How can we solve this for you? And before that person was done, somebody else jumped in. What happened to us as an organization? What happened to us as a system? Something fell through the cracks, and we shouldn't let this happen again. At that point, I stopped them. I said, stop, 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 stop. Hold on. I went back to the first person, and I said, was there something that you wanted from the group in relation to the things you shared? And she said, oh, no, I just wanted to be heard. Yeah, we could have spent an hour fixing and an hour investigating and never helped her receive the understanding that she really wanted from the other people. So I call this go slow to go fast because if we take the time to create connections, the connection first and then the solutions, we don't have to go back and redo the solutions. If we go back to the previous slide, these solutions, when they happen in organizations and institutions, and especially when they're instituted from on high, what happens? Subtle sabotage foot dragging, resistance, because you haven't included the concerns of the people affected by those decisions. So this was created by one of my colleagues in Balkashten. And what you'll notice is three areas. Don't get distracted by all the words. But we have um, self-expression, honesty, being real, being authentic with others. And the left branch, we have empathy, human understanding. How am I present with you and really getting what it is that you're sharing? Now, sometimes we'll just be present and it'll be in silence. But sometimes we'll reflect out loud what our understanding is in order to demonstrate that we're getting it. Now, the third area is the roots and the trunk of the tree. And this is self-connection, and this is where emotional intelligence and mindfulness are so key. Because it turns out that our self-connection is a limiting factor to authentic self-expression, and it's a limiting factor around empathy. If, if I'm all churned up inside, and I'm going through emotional distress, how present can I be with you in order to listen? Not very much. If I'm holding a storm, and I'm all churned up inside, or if I don't know what's going on for me, how honest can I be with you? So our self-connection is a limiting factor or a supportive factor for this work of uh, creating high-quality connections. I want to illustrate uh, this with a, a little story. And uh, I notice I'm running out of time. So uh, I want to add briefly that Marshall Rosenberg was interested in much more than simply interpersonal harmony. His bigger dream was really social change. And how do we create constructive conversations when we create access to the people who have their hands on the levers of power? 
I'm going to be honest with you. If somebody granted me a 30-minute conversation with Donald Trump, I might need two or three days of empathy before that conversation <laughs> in order to make it a very constructive conversation in a short period of time. So I'll tell you a story from uh, my teacher in this, uh, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg. He was invited to teach at a refugee camp in Palestine, and uh, he's entering the mosque, and there are 170 Palestinian men, and he's getting up on the stage, and his interpreter turns to him and he says, they're murmuring that you're an American. And at that point, someone in the audience stands up, points his finger at Marshall, and yells, you murder! And then other people chime in. Child killer, assassin, butcher, and the whole room starts to get riled up. So Marshall and his interpreter are like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, hold on, hold on. And then Marshall addresses the man who spoke to him, and he said, he said, sir, are you upset because you would like my government to spend its resources in a different way? The guy's like, damn straight. We don't need bombs. We don't need armored bulldozers. We don't need tear gas. We need schools. We need housing. We need health clinics. So Marshall, hanging in with him, said, so it sounds like there's a sense of maybe desperateness around uh, you wanting the world to know the kinds of conditions that you're living under. Is that correct? And the man said, yes. You ever seen schools without books? You ever seen children playing in the open sewers? So Marshall, again, staying with him, demonstrating a different quality of listening, said, so it sounds like you only want for your children what any parent would want for their own children. The guy said, that's right. This went on for about 40 minutes. At the end, after the guy was done talking, because he'd gotten enough empathy, he was vented out, Marshall came back with his honesty, and he said, sir, I'd like you to know I feel rather frustrated right now because I was invited to teach something here, so would it work for you if I just continue with my presentation? And the guy who called him a murderer said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So Marshall continued with his presentation. At the end of Marshall's presentation, the same man who had called him a murderer came up to the front and thanked Marshall and invited him to have Ramadan dinner with his family. So these are the kinds of shifts that are available when we have a high skill level. I have so many more stories, a lot of my own, and I'm practically out of time. Just have a couple more minutes. So, uh, you know, there is a model for nonviolent communication. It has two parts, empathy and honesty, also listening and speaking. And there are four components. You want to offer a clear observation of what happened, how you're feeling, because of what core motivator or universal human need isn't met, and then having a very clear, doable request at the end. However, the model is not nonviolent communication. Raise your hand if you're confused. Nonviolent communication, what it is, is the consciousness that we bring to our interactions. If my intention is to create a high quality of connection, and I'm willing to work toward a win-win outcome, a mutually agreeable, a mutually enriching outcome, that's nonviolent communication. I don't care what words you use. If my intention is to get my way, if my intention is to manipulate a specific outcome, I can use words that sound like this all day, but it's not NVC. So it's primarily the consciousness and the intentionality that we bring to our interactions. I want to point out some resources. The Center for Nonviolent Communication operates globally based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We have about 700 certified trainers all over the world. Um, work collaborative, collaboratively com. Is Dean Killian here? Did she make it in? There she is. Can you stand up just for a second? This is a local resource. This is, this is one of the certified trainers uh, in our network, and she's here in New York. So work collaboratively com. Thanks, Dean. And uh, she has cards, and you can connect with her at the end. Uh, anybody here from NYC NVC? Another local resource, nonviolent communication here in New York City. Uh, NVC Academy has a lot of resources online. And lastly, this is my website, Cascadia Workshops. The word Cascadia is a, a tip of the hat to the bioregionalism movement. Cascadia is the name of the bioregion that I happen to live in. So in the uh, last minute and a half that I have, I'll just tell you another quick story. I was presenting at an event. I was part of a panel. At the end of the event, somebody comes up to me and does what most of us would call yelling within maybe six inches of my face, telling me how my values are what's destroying the world. 
my first impulse was to punch this person in the face. And I noticed it. I didn't act on it. I noticed it. And it, it gave me some awareness that I was in pain. Before I hit somebody, I need to be in pain. And the theory behind that is I'm hurting. So I'm going to make you hurt so you know the kind of pain I'm in. We all know that doesn't usually result in understanding. But I noticed this. So I went inside, and I worked in this area down here, the self-connection. And I got clear. I was irritated because I value a different quality of dialogue. And I was really, really disappointed because I wanted some understanding. I wanted to be seen differently. And boom, I was back. I was present with him. And I was able to give him empathy. Oh, sounds like you have some values that are really, really important to you. That's right. The dialogue continued, but it didn't escalate. So just that brief moment, using emotional intelligence, using the skills from nonviolent communication, going inside allowed me to prevent a potential conflict and begin to create a connection with somebody who came toward me quite aggressively. So thank you for your time. It's really a joy to be here, and uh, I wish you all a great rest of the day and a great life making a difference in the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. And I must uh, congratulate you on your Hindi pronunciation. And um, I wonder if you know of a connection between Mahatma Gandhi and Albuquerque. Not the Albuquerque where you live, but the house where he was assassinated was earlier on Albuquerque Road. It was named after British Governor General. It was Albuquerque Road. He was assassinated there, and today it's named 30th January Road after the day of his martyrdom. But thank you for that presentation.